So it's a pleasure to be here, and I thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, I'm a string theorist, a physicist, not much of a philosopher, and not terribly knowledgeable about loop quantum gravity, so I puts me sort of the odd man out here. Um, I'm going to try to give an overview of string theory, and I'll leave the more technical details for the talks later on this afternoon. So, I was asked not to give a history of string theory, but I find it hard to talk about where we are today without saying a little bit about where we've been. So I will say just a few words to get started about different eras of string theory. Um, this is my classification, but I don't think it makes a certain amount of sense. So there was a period starting in 1968 where strings were used as a model of the strong interactions, and no one had ever thought about applying them to quantum gravity. Um, that era kind of ended with the discovery of asymptotic freedom in QCD, which killed string theory as a model of the strong interactions. Uh, it was then proposed that certain features of string, the string theories that have been developed would, should apply to quantum gravity. And for about uh, eight years, uh, there was this proposal that string theory should be a theory of quantum gravity. And for the most part, the people pushing that idea were ignored. Then, as you probably know, starting about 1984, there was a huge surge of interest in string theory called this unification area. It was an area that was proposed that not only quantum gravity, but the whole standard model of particle physics should all be embedded in string theory. Uh, that was followed by a duality era, where there was more of an emphasis on the space-time point of view rather than world sheet and conformal field theory techniques. And I think we're now in, perhaps near the end, of an era called the ADS-CFT era, which is also a kind of duality, but a more dramatic one involving much different constituents, and one that um, has had both formal and perhaps practical applications. And so I will try to focus more on these later eras and talk about where string theory is with regard to them. So, each of these different periods of string theory has led to different answers to some of the fundamental questions in string theory, and fundamental questions, I think, in some of them relate to any theory of quantum gravity. So what is it exactly that is string theory? Uh, what does it tell us about the nature of space-time? Is space-time emergent? What is the nature of background independence in string theory? This is an issue that has been at the forefront of developments in quantum gravity and often used to beat string theorists about the head with, and I will try to say a few, few words about why that is. Um, are there experimental tests of string theory, and what are the physical observables of string theory? So, the origins of string theory were in trying to provide an explanation for certain uh, observed regularities in the spectrum of hadronic resonances and in the range of behavior of scattering at high energies and fixed angles. High energies, of course, was high energies back in the 1960s, not the high energies of now, so the relatively low energies by current standards. And one of the regularities is that if you plot the angular momentum J, or the spin really, versus the square of the mass of certain uh, hadronic resonances, here I've plotted the family of rho and omega, well, the names don't really matter, but these are uh, mesons with a certain isospin, they lie on a straight line to a very good approximation. The explanation of this turned out to be, in, in string theory, that you should think of these excitations as the excitations of a rotating quantized string, and when you do that quantum mechanical problem, you find, in fact, that the, that the excitations lie on a straight line like this. Now, this approach floundered because the mathematical consistency, as it was understood at the time, required 26 or 10 dimensions for bosonic or fermionic string theory. And there was also a problem that when you looked at these kinds of plots of j versus m squared, unlike these straight lines in the real world, the straight lines that you got in these string models had the property that they went to mass zero at angular momentum one or angular momentum two. And so there were massless states that had spin one or spin two, and there are no hadronic resonances that are massless and have spin one or spin two. 
So in 1974, Schwartz Schwartz and Yumea proposed a reinterpretation. If you look at gravitational perturbations about flat space and quantize those perturbations, you get a spin two particle. It's massless, and they, the graviton, and they proposed that the massless spin two particle string theory should be viewed at the graviton. And the massless spin one particle should be viewed not as mesons that have the long mass, but rather as the massless gauge fields as occur in electromagnetism or now in the standard model. <coughs> and they were, for the most part, ignored. Um, this is a plot of the number of citations of the paper by Shirk and Schwartz as a function of time that I got from Spires. And there's a little dribble of interest here, and then 1985, suddenly everybody starts paying attention. So there was a 10-year period when string theorists were wandering in the wilderness. And I can remember listening to talks by John Schwartz and thinking, this is never going to fly. And it may be that many of you still think that. But. So the situation changed in 1984, I think, well, for two reasons. One, there was this upsurge of interest in QCD as a theory of the strong interactions that continued, but after a number of things had been worked out, there was time to do other things. And the people pursuing string theory at the time, in particular Green and Schwartz, discovered a anomaly cancellation in certain string theories that have a chiral spectrum that distinguish left-handed from right-handed fields. And uh, a new kind of string theory, the heterotic string, and compactifications of that led to a framework where the idea of starting in 10 dimensions didn't seem quite so ludicrous because you could compactify six of the dimensions and end up with something that was recognizable as a cartoon version of the standard model. And by that, by a cartoon, what I mean is that you have a theory that has gauge groups, you have chiral fermions, such that the interactions distinguish left-handed from right-handed fermions, and you have a replication of families as observed in the standard model. Now, of course, instead of three families, you might have 98. Instead of SU3 times SU2 times U1, you might have E8 times SU5 times U1. And um, whether you regard that as close to the standard model or not, I guess it's a matter of taste. <laughs> but it, it was striking, and I think particularly striking was the fact that the standard model is chiral, and you could naturally get chirality out of these kinds of constructions. The other interesting thing is that in doing this compactification, in 1984, 1985, mathematicians knew of literally a handful of collabial spaces, I think maybe four or five. And if you, if you were optimistic, you might think, well, maybe there are only seven of them, and one of them gives the standard model. But of course, that turned out not to be the case. There were thousands of them. The mathematicians were inspired to construct more than we wanted. <laughs> <laughs> there were large numbers of discrete choices having to do with choosing various kinds of fluxes. And as well, in this framework, one has unbroken supersymmetry, and there are scalar fields that can be varied uh, continuously without any cost and vacuum energy, and those moduli, these discrete choices, are all needed, have to be specified to specify the low energy four dimensional theory. So, critics have claimed that this makes string theory untestable. I think that's a little bit too strong a statement. Uh, it certainly makes it very difficult, and it depends upon, I think, exactly how you view string theory. Is string theory a single unified theory of quantum gravity and particle interactions? Or is it a framework like quantum field theory is a framework, and you should build a model within that framework to describe low energy physics? I mean, after all, if you want to formulate the standard model, you have an infinite choice of gauge groups, an infinite choice of representations of the gauge groups, even if you restrict yourself to spin zero and spin a half and spin one particles. And, of course, the way that we were able to narrow this infinite choice down to a few choices and then to a unique choice was because we have experimental input. You know, in the early days of the standard model, you know, every week there was another paper. Instead of SU2 times U1, it was SU2 times SU2 times U1. It was, you know, lots of variants were considered. They were ruled out by experiment. 
So I think the fundamental problem is simply the experimental inaccessibility of the energy scale at which string theory effects take place, and also the scale at which quantum gravity effects take place. There's no getting around in any easy way that I know the fact that we do energies much below the Planck scale. And yes. So do I understand correctly? You're interpreting string theory not as a theory, but as a framework, a little bit like gauge field theories. And then a specific theory will be given by a specific choice of the ingredients and dynamics and so on. I think that is a reasonable point of view. It's not a universally accepted point of view. It's what you're I, suggesting. I, it's what I'm suggesting, yes. You know, this thing will advance it, but somehow I find it hard to use this with <laughs> fancy technology. All right, so now I'm going to move on briefly to talk, and I will talk sort of in more detail as I get later in time about the duality current. And this uh, started really with the paper of Asha Sens, who found new evidence for an old idea that had not been really taken all that seriously by most people. And that is the idea that there was a particularly uh, maximally supersymmetric version of gauge theory, Daniels theory, N equals 4 supersymmetry, that had an exact duality which generalized the electric magnetic duality of Maxwell's equations in the absence of currents, exchanging the electric and magnetic field, but also taking the coupling to its inverse. And actually, in this check, this was extended to a slightly well, a more interesting and a larger symmetry, in that in this theory, in addition to the gauge coupling constant, there is another parameter called the theta angle uh, that multiplies FF dual in the action, just like 1 over G squared multiplies F squared in the action. And you can combine this theta angle along with the coupling into a complex parameter tau. And the claim was that this theory has a duality under changes of this complex parameter tau by a tau plus b over c tau plus d, where a, b, c, d are integers, and a, d minus b, c is equal to 1. And this set of transformations is known as the group f scale to z. So here is a picture. Without this symmetry, the parameter space of the theory would be everything that's in the interior of these black lines. So the imaginary part is related to the theta angle, which has a 2 pi periodicity. That's why I can choose it between minus pi and pi. The imaginary part here had to do with the coupling constant g and can vary from 0 to infinity as g varies from infinity to 0. But if this duality group acts, it says that any time you have a theory that has a value of tau any place in this upper half plane, I can map it into the region bounded by this lower semicircle and these uh, black lines. So in particular, I, can, I never have to consider very strong coupling. I can always take the coupling to be one or less. So this duality found uh, many pieces of evidence for it, and it was quickly extended to supersymmetric string theories leading to a lot of nice results involving Claudia's spaces. These dualities are much more involved and less trivial than uh, the strong coupling duality, weak strong coupling duality of n equals 4 young mills. For example, one of the claims of this duality would be the one kind of string theory, the heterotic string, on a space which is K3, which is a four-dimensional version of a Calabria space, times a two-torus is dual to another string on a six-dimensional Calabria space. So even the geometries are different, which I'm a physicist, but I, for the first time in a talk, I'm going to use the word ontological. <laughs> this leads to some ontological tension in what is real if you say that two theories with different geometries are somehow connected to each other. Now, my own point of view, and I will say a little bit more in the next slide about philosophy, is that these dualities should really be understood as different descriptions of one underlying mathematical or physical object. In the same way, for example, that you would take a quantum mechanical system and think of a state of that system as a state in an abstract Hilbert space, 
that you could represent either in the coordinate space representation or in the momentum space representation. And those two representations would give you particle wave dual descriptions of one underlying object, which lives in an abstract Hilbert space. So there's a uh, nice paper by Rickles called The Philosopher Looks at String Dualities. And I won't say that I appreciate all the subtleties, but it, it's clear in his description that he views gauge symmetries as redundancy, or he views dualities as kind of gauge symmetries, that is redundancies in our description, rather than symmetries acting on different physical configurations. <coughs> But he, I think, is troubled by the fact that these representations are surprisingly different in appearance and have radically different ontologies, even structural and topologically distinct space-time. So rather than trying to address philosophical issues connected with this, which I think will be done in part in later talks, I would just like to mention something that I have not seen in the philosophical literature, although that is quite possibly out of ignorance. But I'm going to mention it because I think it's a useful um, addition to this kind of description. If you've read Dean's paper, you've read most of the literature. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to know. Um, <laughs> you just read Nick's paper and you're done. <laughs> so, um, one could ask whether there are examples where this idea that dual descriptions are really redundant gauge-related descriptions, that is, dualities are kind of discrete gauge symmetries. Can you make this idea more precise? And the first example where you can do this is a famous example of t-duality involving string theory on a circle of radius r. So as you've probably heard at some point, if you take string theory propagating on a circle of radius r, in quantum mechanics, we have a quantized momentum from demanding periodicity of the wave function. The, the momenta are quantized as n over r, where n is an integer. But in a closed string theory, string theories can wrap that circle, and they have an energy, which is the circumference of the circle times the energy per unit length of the string. So that is given by an integer, which is the winding number, time and, uh, times r. So those two kinds of states, the momentum states and the winding states, are exchanged when r goes to 1 over r, up to, well, there's a factor, a dimensionful factor here, which is the string tension. So the parameter space of the theory, well, and not only the spectrum, but you can show that all the interactions are invariant under a transformation where r goes to alpha prime over r. So the parameter space of the theory is not the real line, it's a, it's a half line that starts at the fixed point here and goes on to infinity. If you ever want to talk about a distance less than this, I can always choose to talk about a larger radius by simply doing this duality transformation. Now this has a lot of interesting implications in more complicated situations, but that's not really what I want to talk about right now. What I want to mention is that when you go and look at the fixed point of this transformation, so if you sit at this radius squared of alpha prime, then in string theory, you actually find an enhanced symmetry, an enhanced gauge symmetry. States that were massive become massless at this point, and what happens is that you find an SU2 gauge symmetry. This t-duality transformation is actually a discrete element in SU2. So it is a Z2 subgroup of the gauge group of the theory. At that point, it is a redundancy because it corresponds to a gauge transformation. If it's a redundancy at one point, it's a redundancy at all points. As you move away from that point, you break the gauge symmetry. But as you know, gauge symmetries are never really broken. It's just a convenient way of, it's an abusive language that's useful but not rigorously correct. So this t-duality transformation really should be thought of as a discrete gauge transformation, and you can see that explicitly by going to a particular point in the moduli space of the theory, where it is literally an element of the SU2 gauge symmetry. Another example is this n equals 4 super Yang mills. There's a lot of evidence that this arises by taking a somewhat mysterious superconformal field theory in six dimensions and compactifying it on a two-torus. 
This SL2Z weak strong coupling duality that I talked about can then be realized very concretely as a group of global diffeomorphisms of the two torus. So if you take a donut, you can slice the donut, you can do a two-pi twist, and you can glue it back together. And if you do that about the two different cycles on a two torus, you can generate this group SL2Z. <coughs> Diffeomorphisms should be thought of as gauge symmetries, as redundancies. So here again, this weak strong coupling duality is related directly to something that we would naturally view as a gauge symmetry. So I am not sure that this is true in every example, but in these two very interesting examples, it's really possible to make this claim that dualities are redundancies in this description should be thought of as gauge symmetries are very concrete. Now, the proposed dualities in string theory when they were first proposed, uh, were lacking some states that were supposed to be the images under these duality transformations. Those states are now called D-brains and were found or discovered uh, to be there in the formalism of string theory, but overlooked. And studies of these D-brains have led to many remarkable things, but one of the most remarkable is observation of Juan Maldacena. And that is that if you consider N C and sub C of these D brains, D3 brains in particular, meaning that they have three spatial dimensions and one time dimension, when they are on top of each other, you find that the excitations, the degrees of freedom that live on the brain, are those of SU, NC, Yang Mills with N equals 4 supersymmetry, the theory that has this duality symmetry. So you know what the spectrum is, and you know a lot of properties about this. But there's another point of view, which is these brains have tension, and they warp the space-time. And you can also look at what the bulk excitations look like near the D-brains, and they are described by a string theory on a space which is five-dimensional anti-de-sitter space times a five-sphere. And in both of these descriptions, you find a set of states which, in a limit of large NC and low energy, decouple from the rest of the theory. Since both descriptions give a set of decoupled state, well, state, states, Maldacena proposed that these two theories were, in fact, the same. And this is really the craziest thing that I think most people have ever heard of. Um, if you think about it for a minute, this is a gauge theory. This is a gravitational theory. Well, it has gravity and a low energy limit, but it's the theory. They seem to have nothing to do with each other. And it's really hard to understand how this is possible. Well, one of the ways that it's possible is you are instructed to take a limit of large NC. And although we don't normally think of that as a classical limit, it is a classical limit. That is, if you have a quantum system, there can be more than one way of taking the classical limit of that quantum system. One is you only consider situations where the action of various configurations are very large compared to h bar, so you can take h bar to zero. But another can occur when the number of degrees of freedom goes to infinity in such a way that quantum correlation functions factorize in the way the classical ones would. And it had been known that the large NC limit of Yang Mills theory was a classical limit. We now know what that classical limit is for the special theory. The classical limit is a weakly coupled string theory on a curve space. So this proposal of Baldacena's was the start of the era that we're now in, where not all, but much of the research is focused on trying to understand the implications of this BDS CFT correspondence. And in this development, string theory is now regarded as yet something new. Not, I mean, maybe it's a theory of quantum gravity, maybe it's a unified theory, but it also is even more like quantum field theory in that it's a framework for trying to study certain kinds of theories. It can be extended beyond this um, example involving maximally supersymmetric gang mills 
to less supersymmetric systems, and even systems that are not exactly conformal invariant. But it maintains the fact that it takes a strongly coupled system and maps it to a weakly coupled system. So you can ask whether you can study strongly coupled theories or other things that arise in mathematics, cosmology, and particle physics using this correspondence by mapping a computation that would be very hard to do into a computation that's easier to do. And I'm afraid that this is all sounds rather mysterious if you haven't heard it before, or maybe even if you have. Um, and I don't really have time to go into any great detail, but I just I want to sort of mention one point about trying to apply this. Because we're now in a very strange situation where there are prominent condensed matter theorists learning general relativity. You might think that this was totally the last thing in the world they would want to learn, but they are doing that because there are many strongly coupled systems, for example, the systems that describe high temperature superconductors, that are hard to analyze by conventional means. Of course, there are other condensed matter physicists who make fun of people who do this sort of thing and think it's totally ridiculous, but let's be generous. <laughs> there is a strange aspect to it, though, a kind of postmodern version of physics. And the closest analogy I can come to is the game show Jeopardy. So in the game show Jeopardy, which I must say I don't think I've ever watched, but I know, <laughs> but I, but I know that Deep Blue was able to beat humans at the game, so. Um, but in Jeopardy, you are provided with an answer, and you're asked to determine the appropriate question. Maybe somebody can quick give me an example. But, I don't know, chop down a cherry tree. Who is George Washington? Or so, uh, anyway, you have to phrase you have to phrase your answer as a question. So, normally in condensed matter physics, you would start with a particular system that you wanted to study. You would model it as accurately as you could, trying to capture the most important physics in a way that you could still do calculations. You would then see if your model fit the experimental data on your system. In ADS-CFT, you do it the other way around. And I will use an example from a talk that Gary Horowitz gave at the last strings meeting. So if you consider a charged black hole in an asymptotically anti-de-sitter space, <coughs> to make it charged, you have to couple it to a gauge field, which plays the role of electromagnetism. You can then probe the black hole with an electric field and ask how it responds. By doing that, you can compute a frequency-dependent optical conductivity, and you can show, by solving the Einstein equations coupled to uh, electromagnetism and computing this optical conductivity, that in an intermediate range of frequency, it scales as the minus two-thirds power of the frequency. So given this answer, this computation, the question they propose is, what is the intermediate frequency dependence of the optical conductivity of a particular high TC superconductor known as BISCO? And the answer to their question, of course, is there's an intermediate range where it scales this way. This is a different way of doing science than we would normally do it. Is it legitimate? Is it a fluke? If you do a computation and you have enough systems to look over, then you're bound to find some that has the right thing to do. I think this is actually an interesting result because I don't, well, but I, I think, but I think it needs to be further justified. So how would you justify this further? Well, if this result could be shown to be universal over some class of systems, and some kind of dynamical mechanism could be extracted from the numerical results, then you might try to apply that more generally and see how broadly it applies and, you know, eventually, essentially be doing conventional condensed matter physics, but with some input from this insight. That has not occurred in this particular example to my knowledge, but there are other examples where one, again, does computations that you couldn't get at in any other way using these kinds of techniques. So there's certainly, in terms of the philosophy or the history of science, this is an interesting situation where you have this kind of postmodern, here's a calculation, can you fit it to a system rather than modeling a system and then doing 
it's, it's something new. So we're in string theory today. Um, I'm going to give you kind of a laundry list of topics that were discussed at the last string meeting, just to give you a quick overview. And then I'm going to say a little bit about several topics that I think have come up in the discussion of the philosophy of quantum gravity. And I really would like to make sure that there is time for questions at the end, so I would like to ask when there's, and give me notice when there are like 20 minutes left, and then 10, and I promise not to talk after 10 until a lot of time for, I'll just shut up if you have to very soon. Sorry, I'll be there very soon. <laughs> okay. So here's some of the topics. Um, this isn't really string theory, but supersymmetric gauge theory is connected to string theory in, it, in that it governs the low energy dynamics on deep brains. And it's being used in various interesting ways in mathematics, the study of variance of manifolds of various dimension. There has been a complete revolution in ordinary field theory in the way that perturbative calculations are done. It used to be that people wrote down Feynman diagrams, computed them, and added them up. That is no longer state of the art. As a matter of fact, it wasn't state of the art 10 or 15 years ago. There are totally new techniques. Some of the ingredients of these new techniques came out of string theory using twisters and other methods. And now, high order complicated calculations are done without adding Feynman diagrams. These calculations would often involve adding the results of thousands of diagrams that were done by computer in the past. You now write down a very simple answer using very sophisticated techniques. There are some versions of gravity that include higher spin fields, higher than spin two, uh, in anti dissonance space. And these also seem to have dual descriptions in terms of conformal field theories, and those are being explored. The applications of AES-CFT extend not only to condensed matter systems, but to hydrodynamics and uh, condensed and strong interacting systems like the quark flow and plasma. Uh, there have also been interesting studies of entanglement entropy in quantum systems. There's a way of mapping these to geometrical uh, calculations in gravity. Um, I think I'll skip this. Uh, there's been a debate you might have heard about because it's been in the press called the firewall debate. Um, Stephen Hawking famously conceded a bet about whether black hole formation and evaporation violates unitarity. There are indirect arguments based on ADS CFT that it can't because you can map it to a calculation of A equals 4 Yang Mills where it's sort of manifestly unitary. But it doesn't really give you a local description of how it happens, and there's been renewed debate about what the detailed local analysis is of black hole formation and evaporation. Uh, starting with the claim that there's some, if you jump into a black hole, that you're met with a firewall of highly excited states at the horizon, which seems crazy because the horizon is just no, nothing special, but anyway. There's been a, a, lot, a lot of debate about that. Um, all right, I'm just going to skip over this. Well, this is an amusing slide, but I'm going to skip over it today. What does ER equal E to the Oh. Einstein Rosen equals Einstein Oh, uh, yeah. So there's a paper by Malmesing and Susskind that proposed that two black holes connected by an Einstein Rosen bridge is a gravitational geometrical dual to two highly entangled black holes. And that in general, entangled states in quantum mechanics should have some kind of geometrical dual involving these kind of short circuits through space time. But I think they would claim that it's only, there's the only reasonable evidence for this occurs for sort of macroscopic black holes, but they would like to suggest that it's true more generally. It's an intriguing idea with cool pictures, but. <laughs> All right, so let me say a little bit about some of these topics. Um, these are things that I, I you know, have read about in reading papers by philosophers on the philosophy of quantum gravity. So background independence. Um, I will belabor a few obvious points. So I'll try to say briefly what my understanding of background independence is, uh, how much we should expect or want, and how much we actually have in current formulations of string theory. 
So in many physical systems, it makes sense to divide the system into a macroscopic part and a small fluctuating part. A simple example occurs in the study of gravitational waves in general relativity, where you say perturb about flat space or some other fixed metric. In the Higgs mechanism of electroweak symmetry breaking in the standard model, which is very analogous to conduct superconductivity, you have a classical field with a value at infinity that is fixed by uh, choosing a minimum of a potential. And quantum mechanics can then not change that value at infinity because it would require infinite action. So it defines a super selection sector for the theory. And you then look at fluctuations about that, which are localized in space-time. And for gravitational waves, these fluctuations will quantize with the graviton. These fluctuations can quantize are the Higgs boson, which I know exists. So the classical part is the background, and you have these quantized fluctuations. Now, of course, sometimes this doesn't work so well if the fluctuating part is very large. If the fluctuations are sufficiently large, you can get new physics. In general relativity, you can form black holes. But all right, in many situations, the fluctuations are in some sense small. Now, Background independence is the demand that the theory not require a specification of the background in advance, but it should be determined as a solution to the equations of motion, which don't refer to preferred background. So in Einstein's general relativity, you don't have to say what the metric is. You solve the Einstein equations. String theory as formulated in the mid-1980s did involve a kind of separation into a background and fluctuations. But you should ask, what are the equations that determine the background? The equations that determine the background in the 1980s were the equations that determined conformal invariance of the theory of the string propagating in the space-time. Those equations of conformal invariance were r mu nu minus 1 half g mu nu r equals t mu nu plus corrections. So you get the Einstein equations out of a fundamental dynamical principle with corrections that are well-defined. And you don't have to specify what the background is, but you do have to be able to construct the conformal field theory in that background to then quantize the string theory. It doesn't seem to me that much different than starting with the Einstein-Lagrangian solving it to find a background that is flat space or center space or anti center space and then looking at small fluctuations. So there is some background dependence, I guess, but I think it's rather weaker than some critics have claimed. And of course, with no classical background, we have a problem which I think we've also heard in discussions of quantum gravity. What does general relativity mean when I don't expand around a classical background? If there's no metric, then how do I get started? What am I supposed to do? Now, the ADS-CFT correspondence shed, shed some additional light on this. So it can be formulated in a way that does not require anti disitter space-time everywhere, but only a space-time that becomes anti disitter space at its boundary. And the formulation does not depend on the background of the bulk. It just is background dependent on specifying the asymptotic geometry. And in fact, there were puzzles about how to formulate GR in anti disitter space before the ADS-CFT correspondence, because light rays can travel out to the boundary and back into the interior in finite time, according to an observer in the interior. And therefore, to say what an interior observer will measure, you have to specify what's happening at the boundary. Is there a mirror there? Is it absorbing? So essentially, you need to put boundary conditions on the fields in order to define your observables in anti disitter space. So it seems to me that a formalism which is independent of the choice of boundary behavior may or may not exist. It's not clear to me what problem we would encounter in theory of quantum gravity if I had to specify the asymptotic behavior of my space-time as part of the data, and I then had background independence of everything that went on in the interior. There's no finite uh, energy excitation that can change that asymptotic behavior. Uh, is, it, is this situation somehow analog of being able to define a path integral for quantum gravity, 
but only with given boundary states. Uh, if the boundary state, given boundary states meaning specifying the the boundary boundary behavior of the boundary, yes, I think it's similar to that. So it would be a sector of whatever full quantum gravity theory in which you could consider all possible boundary states. Right. So I think when one discusses this issue of background independence, it's very important to, to distinguish independence of the bulk background from independence of the boundary background because they play distinct physical roles. Once you fix the asymptotic behavior, there's no finite energy, finite action deformation that will take you to a new one. And you're perfectly allowed to do quantum mechanics in a theory with those given boundary conditions. So, okay, great. So the ADS-CFT correspondence also provides us with an example of a theory that has different classical limits and in which at least part of space is emergent. Uh, so, for example, when I talk about this duality, I didn't specify, but we're doing n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory in four dimensions. The claim is that at very strong coupling and large numbers of colors, that theory has a weak coupling description in terms of a theory in ADS 5 times S5. Six dimensions have fallen down from the sky. Where did they come from? They emerged in some way. One of those dimensions seems most naturally, based on the way conformal transformations work, to be thought of in terms of an energy scale. And of course, the formulation that we now have of quantum field theories does depend on an energy scale. I mean, Ken Wilson, uh, rest his soul, taught us that most quantum field theories should be thought of as low energy effective field theories, and that we should think about how they evolve with energy scale. So that kind of comes out in a geometrical formulation. The five sphere is less clear, but n equals 4 yang mills theory has an SO6 symmetry, which is the isometry group of S5, and that isometry group, or that symmetry group, somehow actually turns into a geometry which has that symmetry in the strong coupling limit. So this is a very nice example where there's a kind of emergent space. Uh, there are other examples. I don't know of any examples in string theory where you would really say that time is emergent, however. It seems much easier to get an emergent space than to get emergent time, but... So, Jeff, the now should say not. That W should be a T. I am now aware. <laughs> <laughs> I was a microsecond ago, but now I'm not aware anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I also just wanted to mention uh, briefly that there have been claims for some time that superstring theory provides an ultraviolet finite theory of quantum gravity in which loop corrections to say graviton scattering can be computed, you get finite answers, they're unitary, they're sensible, and with enough strength you can just keep computing to higher and higher orders. Now, there have been nagging worries um, because this is you really only get well-defined amplitudes in superstring theory, and there have been some very subtle mathematical issues in how to deal with higher genus Riemann surfaces. This is not something that many of you are necessarily aware of, but for example, it was, it was mentioned in the Smolin's critique of string theory. Um, these worries, I think, have been put to rest in a series of highly technical and long papers by Ed Whitman collaborators who analyzed in great detail how you do the integral over these higher dimensional Riemann surfaces that appear in higher order string perturbation theory. So it's clear now that there is a perfectly well-defined perturbation theory for superstring theory. Now, of course, as in any interesting theory, in including, yeah. So when you say you need finite, you mean there's no need for renormalization? There's no need for renormalization. You just get finite answers banging the nose. You don't have, you never encounter infinity. You never have to subtract anything. It behaves the way you would really expect a fundamental theory to behave. In that, I think the, I mean, the, the modern view of renormalization and the renormalization group is that you need to specify certain data at short distances in order to say what the theory is, and you can trade that information for physically measured low energy parameters. But there's nothing that tells you when you take the 
that data to very short distances that you might find in phases. But if there's really some fundamental theory at some point, then that should not happen. You should just get finite answers. And that's what happens in spring. So, so, so if I understand correctly, you would say that you still need renormalization, but only in the sense of extracting an effective uh, description of whatever fundamental theory you started from. Right. If you, want, if you want to understand the structure of low energies, then you might want to do a finite renormalization from the string scale to low energies. But you, you don't have to do uh, infinite renormalizations. Maybe that's the best way to say it. Now, of course, perturbation theory does not define the theory. It doesn't define the theory in string theory. It doesn't define the theory in quantum electrodynamics. It doesn't define the theory in quantum chromodynamics. It doesn't define the theory if you look at an anharmonic potential in quantum mechanics. Perturbation theory series almost never converge in interesting systems. So the problem then is that there must be non-perturbative effects, which are not visible to any order of perturbation theory. We know what many of those are. They involve D-brains, various kinds of instantons. It's difficult to really prove that this defines all these amplitudes non-perturbatively, because you have to merge the perturbative and non-perturbative effects together. And even in simple quantum mechanical problems, doing that is a real mathematical tour de force. It hasn't been done in ordinary field theories. It hasn't been done in string theory. But I don't think there's any reason to doubt that it's possible. So let me end with a few comments about philosophers of science and string theorists. So uh, here's a quote from another paper, paper of Rickles. You don't have to go on in great detail, but I just mentioned that you'll see the names Rovelli, Baez, Eshtekar, Smolin, Rovelli, Smolin, talking about their heightened sense of philosophical awareness and in general their sensitivity and interest in the contributions from philosophers. Here's a quote from Feynman. And, you know, you've probably seen things like this. <laughs> and I think it goes without saying that loop quantum gravity has its roots in general relativity, and major figures in that field have been very open to the insights from philosophy. String theory and string theorists, by and large, come from particle physics and have different insights and different attitudes, both about physics and, to some degree, about philosophy. In terms of physics, one of the insights that I think drives many string theorists based on their experience in particle physics is that we have many examples of non-renormalizable effective field theories, ranging from the description of nuclear interactions by pions to the Fermi-4 fermion theory of the weak interactions. And all every time we encounter something like this, we've had to replace it by some other fundamental theory of short distances. When there is a dimensional scale in your theory, uh, the lesson we learned is that means the theory works up to that scale, and past that scale, you better do something new. So this point of view makes string theorists skeptical that loop quantum gravity, which takes Einstein gravity as the fundamental starting point, is really a fundamental theory. We think it's more likely an effective field theory that works up to the Planck scale or someplace below it, and then has to be replaced by something else. Certainly, experimentally, all of our evidence about the behavior of general relativity comes from scales that are enormous compared to the Planck scale. There's no evidence that general relativity is the correct description within any number of orders of magnitude of the Planck scale. So this makes most string theorists suspect that loop quantum gravity has difficulty obtaining macroscopic space times because loop quantum gravity doesn't exist, in the same sense that quantum electrodynamics doesn't exist. It works fine as a low energy effective theory. You can quantize it, but that quantization breaks down at very high energy scales. So, sorry, what's the meaning of a theory that doesn't exist? I mean that it doesn't exist as a mathematical theory at all energy scales in isolation. May I ask you, is a string theory where they find below the Planck uh, scale? Yes. But uh, this is what I was asking before. Don't you have the fact that a closed string would open up uh, and so you... Well, I don't know what you mean open up. I mean, the, the, they become fuzzier, but that fuzziness regulates the high energy behavior. You can take amplitudes, whether they're tree level or at loops, and you can study the high energy behavior, and it has a high energy behavior which is quite well behaved. It doesn't become singular. Okay, I have another question. So do you think that the fact that uh, special relativity has a maximal velocity of the fact that uh, there is H-bar in 
how the mechanics makes, makes this theory having the same problem as the loop quantum gravity because you cannot have uh, you cannot describe physics uh, with a velocity higher than c. I mean, here is the same thing in uh, loop why, quantum why, gravity. Why do I want to describe physics with velocities higher than c? I, 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 because you are saying in loop quantum gravity you take the same approach. The fact that uh, uh, there is uh, a fundamental length and nothing exists below that length. So you are saying, oh, in a theory in which there is such a thing, uh, this can make people suspicious, but we, we see this kind of theories in nature. So. I'm not, well, I, I think there's, I, I'm not sure what the, what the speed of light and relativity had to do with it. I mean, the, the, the Dolomite description of string theory has this Lorentzian variant in the same way that Standard model of yeah, no, my, my question was about the fundamental uh, constant in nature. Yeah. Well, in, in string theory, there is also a fundamental scale. Um, so the way uh, the I mean the, the intuition that I was mentioning is an intuition based on the behavior of field theories, quantum field theories, with a finite number of degrees of freedom. In string theory, there are an infinite number of degrees of freedom, and it seems that the intuition should then be changed because the infinite number of degrees of freedom have a way it can, can smooth out the singularities, essentially. Okay, sorry. Can smooth out the, the bad and high energy behavior. There's several people who want to jump in at this point, and the question is up, it's up to you whether you want to first... Let finish. me finish, I'm almost done. Okay. So let me finish, and then I'm happy to, yeah. Um, all right, anyway, so all I'm trying to, I guess one thing I'd like to say is that in spite of this somewhat antagonistic uh, relationship in the past, I think it's clear that intellectually, the fact that loop quantum gravity people like you more than string theorists <laughs> does not reflect on which is more likely to be the correct theory. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a number of things where string theory does well, but there are a number of things that it doesn't do very well, and where I think more conceptual clarity could be useful. So, black hole formation and evaporation. I think is recognized as one of the great Gedanken experiments in trying to probe quantum gravity. There is a lot of confusion because many prominent people say crazy things and disagree with each other. So I'm sure there's some progress we made by just thinking more clearly. Um, there's the landscape problem. There are problems having to do with the construction of local observables rather than the global observables that we know how to formulate in terms of the S matrix or in anti-de-sitter space. So I think there's some chance that philosophers can help. And whether or not philosophers can help, I think, is not the main point. The main point is that there are questions emerging from string theory that might be interest intrinsically in philosophy, whether or not you're helpful to physicists. So I tried to give you some quick overview of what some of them might be. And now I'm ready to take help from you. Daniele has been the most impatient <laughs> two or three slides ago. No, can you go back to the slide in which you evaluate the quantum gravity? <laughs> no, no, it was uh, towards the end. Yeah, and this uh, one. Yeah. one yeah. Yeah. There's only two comments. Uh, it's a reasonable point of view. The point is that First of all, there is a part of the loop quantum gravity community and certainly part of the work going on in loop quantum gravity which does not take the dynamics of general relativity as you know, the fundamental, right. does not right. interpret the task of loop quantum gravity as a formalist to canonically or covariantly right. quantize GR in any naive sense. Right. The second, the second comment, the second part of the statement just doesn't follow from the first, in the sense that I can tell you by experience that the difficulties we are facing in uh, recovering uh, macroscopic smooth geometries and space-times within the theory um, do not have to do with the fact that the fundamental dynamics of our models is or is not uh, the canonical covariant quantization of GR it comes from a different type of difficulties. So I wouldn't say okay. that the right. logic of the conclusion is really... Okay, thank, thanks for that. And I, I'm, I'm by no means I'm trying to denigrate work in um, root quantum gravity. I'm just I'm trying to express a, a common point of view and one that I had not heard so far. So. Okay. Bianca. Yeah, it's really similar, actually. It's funny that you say you know, the problem is in the UV, the, 
the definition of the theory in the UV, of course, what became kind of is if there is a definition in the UV, right. and the problem is to go to the infrared and show that gravity emerges there. But you see, so, in quantum field theory, that really is the problem. So, for example, the problem is connecting the UV to the infrared. Yeah, in a finite way. In a finite way. So, I said QED doesn't exist because the coupling gets very strong in the UV or the random hole. But there. QCD does because the coupling goes to zero. So there's an ultraviolet fixed point that you can start with. And in lattice gauge theory, people use that. Yeah, it's much, uh, yeah. So I, I think the real, the real problem in a theory that doesn't exist mathematically is whether you can start in the UV and end up where you want to in the IR. Then it's more, I mean, then... Again, I would uh, to agree with Daniela. It's not so much about which specific theory we have, because in principle, if you would know how to do that, I mean, the problem is more to do renormalization, course learning, and in a background independent context. In but isn't it logically possible that you have a theory that makes sense, that's mathematically consistent, and does not have GR as its lower energy limit? Yeah, it's very, it's, it's possible. It's, sure. you know, but of course you can but try around on, you know, if, if you would know to do that, if I would know how to do that, I could basically tune LKGs and fundamental dynamics there, because, of course, it's kind of some say it's unique, but you know there's possibilities to tweak it, and tweak it and hope that you get uh, you, you get uh, general relativity. Yeah. So there's one point you are saying, which is you know what are the fundamental degrees of freedom, and even there in loop quantum gravity you could say that a certain enlargement of, of geometries. Right. Um, but if you say it should be even something very different from geometries. I don't, think, I don't think uh, I don't think string theory has a particularly good but, answer. Yeah, what no, at that, that point it's completely guessing what are the good degrees of freedom right. that, that Planck scale. Yeah. So then I uh, I don't know what you know. So yeah. I wouldn't say that string theory has the answer. No, 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 no. I, I I hope I've made it clear that I'm not trying to say that string theory has, has many interesting features and properties, but it doesn't have, not have yeah. the answer. So, but uh, it, this, it, it gives us different descriptions of what fundamental degrees of freedom are and different limits. But a full description should say every place in you know in all constructions what what are the fundamental building blocks, how what's the structure, what are the principles, and string theory does not have that. I, I, I don't think string theory is by any sense a finished theory. I mean there are many fundamental questions that we don't have answers to. Your yeah, so I would go to this more fashionable era of the ads CPT, and I have a question about that. So it's interesting that you mentioned uh, in the Jeopardy game uh, the question about the superconductor being answered by the black hole, but it's probably, so my question is, what do you think about the other Jeopardy game in which you actually answer questions about the fund, uh, some fundamental questions about the structure of the black holes by looking at uh, a pure uh, supersymmetric young means theory? That's my first question. And Let me answer the first one because I'll forget it by the time you ask me the second one. Okay, go ahead. In principle, one could do that, but I think in practice it's hard to have control over that. The large end limit of Yang Mills degree, you can do that. Although, I mean, progress is being made on that, but I'm, well, I should be a little cautious. But, I mean, in principle, you're right, but it depends what kind of questions you want to ask. So, if you want to ask weak coupling questions, you can. That requires taking the strong coupling limit of the uh, n equals 4 eight mills, and of course that's hard to do because really we only have perturbation. So, okay. It's been hard to turn it around. A short one? Yes, very short. What role does supersymmetry play in the whole ads uh gain or correspondence? Does it sound like that? I don't think it plays a fundamental role in the existence of the correspondence because you can break supersymmetry and still find examples where there's a lot of evidence that the duality still works. But it's been a great utility in actually checking it because with enough supersymmetry, there are some quantities that don't depend on the coupling that can be computed in, on the two sides and compared. So it's been a very powerful tool for checking it, but I don't think it's required for its existence. Got it. And one aspect that worries people like me when, when, when we hear about string theory is that one is supposed to obtain a theory of quantum gravity, but one starts using 
concepts like energy, length, and all sorts of things that would not be defined without the with, without the metric. And this they seem to play a fundamental role in deciding what are the low energy excitations, the high energy excitations, the dualities that you talked about. Isn't that worrisome that the foundational concepts at the foundational level you would need to rely on things that will only emerge at a much later state from the fundamental theory? Yeah, I think that's a valid critique, and I don't think we have the right fundamental formulation of string theory at the moment. I think we have formulations that work in certain corners or at certain limits, and in those limits it kind of makes sense to use those concepts, but I, I think that's a valid criticism. Last question, Jim. Um, could I ask about uh, gauge, the, gauge symmetry and duality? Um, one is, uh, you were saying, I think after quoting Rickles, that you yourself uh, are inclined to regard the two sides as uh, surprisingly different descriptions of a single reality. Uh, and my question about this, am I right in thinking that that is the uh, most widespread view amongst practitioners, that you know, it's, it's not a coincidence and that there are so to speak two different physical realities being described, it's, it's rather that there's one, and, and in that connection, and so it's a bit like a. But in that connection, your particular argument that because T becomes a discrete transformation on SU2 at the square root of alpha, therefore its gauge generally. Just as an outsider philosopher, it seemed to me that could you have a framework where that argument is a bit of a non sequitur? That a transformation could be gauged relative to one value of the parameter, namely square root of alpha prime, but, but elsewhere not be gauged. I mean, is, is it mandatory that if gauge at one point in that parameter space, then gauge as well? Gauge in the, in the philosophy loaded sense of mere redundancy. I guess in saying that, I'm relying on the idea that when you move away from that point, which what would normally be called gauge symmetry gradient, is really not gauge symmetry gradient. You can describe it that way in a particular gauge, but the gauge there is really are no gauge, not in very observables and expectation noises for gauge array. So one can generally reformulate everything the way it's gauge array. So in the sense that the gauge symmetry is never broken, it seems to me that anything holds at one point should hold at all points. Okay, right. But it okay. might require some care to really figure out how to say that more carefully. Okay, now I'm happy with the idea that gauge symmetry can't have a really broken. It's just that as a total outsider, it doesn't clear to me that as you moved in that parameter space, it would have to be... You, you, can, you, can, you can do that. You can do it as gauge symmetry breaking. You can identify a particular state that gets an expectation value and that it has a potential with a minimum away from the origin. So you, there really is a, a low energy description of moving away from that as gauge symmetry But is it true that all practitioners think that it is a single reality? I cannot speak for all, but 